boa noite, boa noite a todos. Good evening, everyone. Ron. So today we're going to have one more live, and today we're going today we're going to talk about homocystinurias. I'd like to thank Professor Hank Blon. He's always ready to help us. He's been in Brazil many times, and I also like to thank Dr. Ida. She has been always supporting us as well. And because I don't speak English, so Dr. Ida is going to lead today's uh, seminar. For those of you who are just joining us, you will see that at the bottom of your screen, we see an icon like a globe, and you can choose the channel. So select the language of your choice. And after I finish this, I'm going to ask Dr. Ida to also explain this in in English for English speakers, OK? And then we're going to have the presentation. So do you want me to speak in English? Yes, so that people know how to choose the language. One is a, it's a pleasure for us to have this live with uh, Professor Hank Blom. I thank, thank Professor Hank very much. And uh, uh, Simone was trying to explain before uh, how the channel for the translation uh, works. So you have at the bottom of the screen, uh, like three points. Uh, this is a place where you can choose or the English translation or the Portuguese translation. You should do it uh, right now before we start the presentation, okay? Alguma coisa mais, Simone? Simone, any observation in the chat? No. Okay. Uh, Professor Blon will speak to us. Uh, we are not sure if uh, for about 40 minutes or something like that. And after that, uh, we'll open uh, like the space for questions. Uh, you can use the uh, chat for writing your comments and the questions. Simone and I will be reviewing the chat uh, frequently during the session. So any problem you have with, with the translation or even with the sign of the internet, please write uh, in the chat uh, uh, space, okay? So Professor Blum, now it's your turn. We know that you are five hours ahead, so thanks very much again, okay? Thank you very much. Of course, I'd like first like to thank Simona and also uh, and the Mass Metabolic Group and uh, Ida for the uh, possibilities to, to lecture uh, about my, uh, my field, homocystinuria. So I'm very happy to share my knowledge with, uh, with people all around the world, with, with patients, their families, and uh, scientists and doctors. And I'm always happy to, to, to discuss and to... to to provide my knowledge to to give a better diagnosis and treatment for this uh, this group of inborn errors of metabolism. Well, the uh, it's not as as already uh, Simona told. I've been in Brazil before, not many times, but a few times. But I was very happy to be in uh, in Brazil. It's a very interesting country. The first time. I was, uh, it was in Porto Alegre, and then we had our first uh, Brazilian meeting of patients and families with homocystinurias and metabolic acidemias. And uh, two years later, we had even a, an international uh, patient expert meeting in Rio, which was also quite successful. And today is the, the third time uh, we can meet and, and uh, I can lecture and we can discuss uh, on, on homocystinuria today. And I'm very uh, happy to do so. 
Well, I will show you the metabolism many, many times until you can uh, dream it. Uh, I will use it today to explain a uh, lot, lot of things about homocysteine, homocysteinuria, and the disorders. First, I go quickly through the pathway. And uh, if to explain homocysteine, we have to start at methionine. Actually, we have to start at proteins. Our body consists of sugars, fats, and proteins. And proteins consist about of 20 amino acids, and one of them is methionine. So if, if the proteins are degraded, methionine is formed. And methionine has a very peculiar metabolism, which I'll go through uh, quickly. Uh, methionine is activated by uh, ATP to form acetonazole methionine. Now, why do we have acetonazole methionine? That is because this is the metal donor in the body. It, do, it methylates DNA, proteins, uh, neurotransmitters. There are more than 200 different metal transferase reactions in our body. So this is really a very important uh, metabolism. And that's the whole reason why we have uh, homocysteine because it's a product of this uh, metal transfer reaction. These reactions occur in every cell and they are crucial for adequate cell function. The product is acetonazole homocysteine, ADO homocysteine here, and that is normally uh, hydrolyzed into homocysteine and adenosine. It's in interesting or important to, to know that the equilibrium of this reaction is in the direction of acetonazole homocysteine. As a consequence, if homocysteine accumulates, also acetonazole homocysteine will accumulate. And this is an inhibitor of many metal transferase reactions. So one of the, one of the underlying mechanisms why, why high homocysteine is uh, bad for the body is that it inhibits uh, metal transferase reactions. And as I explained before, metal transferase is uh, essential for cell function. And uh, this can explain to quite an, some extent why diseases which cause homocysteine accumulation, why they are bad for the body. And we'll come to back later in the lecture to which kind of organs and systems are involved in this. If you have any questions, I know it's a bit difficult with this uh, with, uh, when we have a lecture like this, but still, if you have questions, you can always ask me also during my lecture. But, uh, homocysteine itself is as the branch point of uh, different reactions. Because homocysteine is depicted here, it can be degraded to cystatinine and then to cysteine and then further down the line to sulfate. And the first step is catalyzed by cystatinine beta synthase, which is uh, the enzyme which, when it's a defect, we talk about classical homocysteinuria. And this enzyme needs B6 to function well. Homocysteine can be degraded, but homocysteine can also be remethylated back to methionine. And therefore, we have the enzyme methionine synthase. And this enzyme requires vitamin B12 for proper function. And it, re it needs a metal group because, as I told you, in the metal transferase reactions, we lose a metal group. And here, when we go back to methionine, it, we need a metal group again. And that comes, in many cases, from folate. Five metal tetrahydrofolate donates a metal group to homocysteine, and then we have methionine again. This circle, this reaction, this metal uh, circle, uh, occurs in every cell, even the red blood cell met has metal transferase reaction. So, um, the metal, 5 metal tetrahydrofolate, is formed from 5 10 methylene tetrahydrofolate, and this reaction is catalyzed by MTHFR or methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. Uh, sorry if I speak these enzymes very quickly but we'll use the abbreviations uh, during my lecture. So MTHFR forms metal tetrahydrofolate, and this needs a vitamin B2, vitamin B2 to, for proper function. Folate is also B vitamin, sometimes called B9, or sometimes even called B11, but it's also a B vitamin. So B vitamins play an important role in homocysteine metabolism. 
and all these red enzymes, CBS, methionine synthase, MTHFR, if they are deficient, they cause homocysteinuria. Um, as I told before, the, we have this, uh, this um, metabolism because we need the metal groups. And therefore, as a denosylmethionine, ADOMET here, is the main regulator of this pathway. It means if we eat a lot of proteins, methionine is high, as a denosylmethionine is high, it will inhibit MTHFR, uh, so we have no little metal tetrahydrofolate and homocysteine cannot be remethylated. And at the same time, as a denosylmethionine will activate CBS, so homocysteine will be degraded. So if we have high intake of methionine, the, the as a denosylmethionine will regulate it in such a way that we degrade homocysteine. On the other hand, if we have low intake of proteins, fasting or uh, when we eat little meat, then as the denosylmethionine goes down, CBS will be not activated and MTHFR will not be inhibited. So then we form metal tetrahydrofolate and homocysteine can be remethylated back to methionine. So the system is very well regulated and that is all still because we need these metal groups. I explained this regulation because Later in my lecture, I will need it to explain certain uh, parts of uh, classical homocysteinuria. And there is also another reaction in the liver and kidney. We also have betaine homocysteine methyltransferase, BHMT, which use betaine to donate a metal group to homocysteine to form back methionine. So there are a lot, a lot, a lot of aspects, and I'll explain them now because later when we talk about treatment these reactions will will come back in my lecture so what what are the causes of uh, elevated homocysteine now i'll go to that in a, if we have cbs deficiency or classical homocysteinuria CBS is not functioning. That means homocysteine cannot be degraded to cystatine in the system, which will be decreased. Homocysteine will be increased, but everything above also. So we see high methionine, high acetonazolmethionine, high acetonazolmethionine, all will be elevated. And because high acetonazolmethionine inhibits MTHFR, we see low metal tetrahydrofolate in CBS deficiency which is important when we want to treat this condition. We also have MTHFR deficiency. Then the body cannot form metal tetrahydrofolate. Homocysteine cannot be remethylated to methionine. Homocysteine goes up, but methionine is low in this condition. And as then as methionine is low, as then as homocysteine is high, homocysteine is high, and cystathionine is high because this reaction will run more frequently. Then we have methionine synthase deficiency. Again, the homocysteine cannot be remethylated to methionine. Methionine is low, acetonazole methionine is low, homocysteine is high, acetonazole, homocysteine is high, and cystathionine is high. In this condition, folate will be increased because folate cannot go through in the body at even 5 metal tetrahydrofolate will accumulate. So we will see high folate in this condition. And the same is true when people are B12 deficient or uh, have a defect in the metabolism of vitamin B12. There are a lot of enzymes involved and before vitamin B12 can be play its role as a vitamin in the body and all defects, uh, there are more than 15 defects known in the whole B12 pathway. I'll not go into that today at all because that uh, takes too much time. But it's important to know that there are also defects in vitamin B12 metabolism. And the most common one is cobalamin C. And I will talk a little bit about cobalamin C later in my lecture. So when do we talk about homocysteinuria or severe hyperhomocysteinemia? We talk, we, we talk about this when homocysteine is higher than 50 and where normal homocysteine is below 15. And 
then we have then we have to consider deficiencies of of the three enzymes uh, I've discussed before. So CBS deficiency, MTHFR, and methionine synthase dysfunction, immune errors of sulfur amino acid metabolism. But there are also other causes for high homocysteine, and even more common, people can be very deficient in folate or very deficient in vitamin B12. And there is also a an, uh, an SNP in MTHFR, a common um, variant. And together with low, with relatively low folate, this can also cause a very high homocysteine. So these are the common causes of severe hyperhomocysteinemia or homocysteinuria. And the rare conditions are the inborn errors, CBS, MTHFR, and methionine synthase. And here are the, the, the incidence rates. MTHFR deficiency is a very rare, one and a half million births in uh, more or less worldwide. Cobalamin C, maybe one in 100,000. And CBS deficiency is a bit strange because we see that I depict here there is the the Chechu Islands that's uh, near uh, Taiwan. They, that's a very small island, and they have a population of people who have an incidence of classical homocysteinuria and one in 240 birds. So that is a very very high incidence. It's probably an inbred for a long 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 time. Also in Qatar, there it's a very uh, homocysteinuria is very common. One in 1,500 birds in Qatar concern a classical homocysteinuria patient. But that's, that, then that's not even considered a rare inborn error of metabolism anymore. In these countries, it's very common. But in other countries, it's way less common. I will go into more detail in the incidence because, as I said, this is the incidence worldwide. It varies, it fluctuates enormously. It has been been also a point of discussion. In Germany, they did a small study on one mutation and they found a couple of heterozygotes in a small group of a couple of hundred people from Germany and then they calculated that the incidence of class chromocystinuria should be one in 70,000. That would mean that there would be way much more patients than we, uh, we are aware of because in Europe we are if we count the number of patients we know, then the incidence would be one in 200,000. So this is a huge discrepancy. And also studies in Denmark and in Norway, but even higher, using very small populations, they came to very high incidences of classical homocysteinuria. So I discussed this with Ida and we, we did a study on this because there is really a discrepancy in uh, in, 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 we see uh, not so many patients as we would predict on, on these small studies. So how can we study the real, uh, how can we do a decent study on the incidence of classical homocysteinuria? For that, uh, the PhD student Giovanna Weber-Holz did a uh, study uh, using the, the Genomat database. And it's depicted here, I'll go into more detail. Genomat is a uh, database for many, many studies, and it totally concerns 100, more than 125,000 exomes and even more than 50,000 whole genome sequences of all kinds of groups. It can be patients, it can also be uh, population genetic studies. So it's a diverse group, but it's a huge group, and they have sequenced the DNA, at least the exomes of many of these people. So this, and these people are from all over the world. So we use this uh, database to calculate the incidence of classical homocysteinuria. Um, so the main result is that if you look in, if you look in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, then we see that the incidence is about one in 100,000 births. So that's uh, here depicted here, one in 100,000 births. And Latin America, it's about half in 100,000 births. So this is a normal uh, inborn error of metabolism. It's a rare condition. And even in Africans, it's even lower. It's even 0.2 in 100,000. And in Asia, it's a very rare inborn error of metabolism because they have calculated only uh, less than um, one fifth of a million birds concerns classical homocysteinuria. 
So this is, and, and, and if you can also calculate the worldwide, then it's 0.38 for 100,000 births. This is much closer to the, to the number of patients we are aware of in Europe and in, in, in uh, Latin America and North America and also in Asia. Because we think that these numbers are more realistic than these studies published on very small populations and that they are probably not correct. We also looked at the, that, um, at the pathogenic alleles distribution over the world. And then particularly one common one is the isolution of threonine, let's call it the blue, which is the most common um, mutation in, in Northwest Europe, and but also in Brazil and in the United States. Other mutations is the, um, is the this one, the orange one, is which is a, a Celtic mutation, and the that's mainly present in, in Ireland and also in Australia, because many I Irish people went to Australia. Um, then in Qatar, there's this, this uh, RG2 cysteine variant is uh, very common in, in two tribes in, in Qatar. If we look at this uh, isolution to three ring uh, variant, uh, which is quite common, you can see that in, in more than 50% of the alleles in Northwest Europe, also Italy, England, well, England is not Europe anymore. So they have, they concern this uh, variant. And this is interesting because this mutation is very well responsive to vitamin B6. I'll come back later to the B6 responsiveness, but these patients are generally uh, respond very well to vitamin B6, which is very 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 elegant way to treat. Um, yes. Then we go on to the clinical presentation of uh, CBS deficiency or classical homocysteinuria. There are four main features, such as uh, skeletal abnormalities, morphologic features, scoliosis, mental retardation, uh, venous and uh, arterial occlusive disease, so premature arteriosclerosis and thrombosis, and ectopia lentis. I'll go to that again, scoliosis, and you see that the spine is not in the, not the straight line, it's really curved. And this is a patient, CBS deficient patient from Nijmegen, and he has all features associated with CBS deficiency. His eye lenses are removed because he had ectopia lentis, he has Marfanoid features, uh, very long arms and legs. Uh, has also uh, uh, spider-like fingers. You can also see he has also scoliosis, as I showed in a previous slide. He is uh, severely mentally handicapped. And he had uh, two times he had a, 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 a thrombosis. So he suffered from all, all, all clinical complications we know with CBS deficiency. But we also know that many, many patients have only one or two of these symptoms. So it's not that in this condition, people have always, patients always have all these, all these symptoms. Often it's only one or two. The ectopia lentis is a, also an interesting and a very, a very peculiar condition because it's a very rare uh, thing that to happen that the eye lens, uh, is this detached, so that's because, uh, because of the high homocysteine and probably also because of the low cysteine, the fibrils which uh, are, are connected to the eye lens, keep it in position, uh, break, and then the eye lens falls down inwards or outward. Um, so if a patient has uh, ectopia lentis next to Marfan syndrome, which is another condition, people, eye doctors should always uh, exclude classical homocysteinuria. Because of this phenomenon, this very peculiar phenomenon, we studied the relation between homocysteine and, uh, and refraction. And uh, we did that in the Gutenberg Health Study. Gutenberg has a, a big an area in Germany, and then more than 15,000 people participated in a huge study, and they were adults between 35 and 74. And we thought that maybe uh, people with high homocysteine have uh, not so good eye lens fibrils and they have high refraction. So we were very, uh, I was very enthusiastic that we could do this study with such a huge population. 
but the result is really is a negative result in a way because in the, here you can see on the x-axis homocysteine levels in these individuals and on the y-axis you see the 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 mean spherical equivalent so the diopters to make it simple so people uh, of older age above 20 often wear glasses and many have minus two minus five many minus six seven and some people have even minus ten so our hypothesis would be that that the people who have uh, minus 10 or even more would have high homocysteine but we don't see that at all so if you look at homo, uh, the higher homocysteine levels these people have the same refraction as the people with low homocysteine so it was in a way a negative result but that's also the way science is you know you do studies and sometimes you find something sometimes you find nothing but that's so we published this last year this year in in uh, plus one which is a very nice journal i continue a little bit on the clinical presentation of the homocysteinurias and then in the this and then i compare cbs deficiency with the cobalamin c uh, deficiency and dhfr deficiency and this is just so a neonatal per period and early infancy and you can see that acute neurologic deterioration is not present in classical homocysteinuria where cobalamin c and mthfr this is really a severe can be a very severe problem seizures we don't see them only in the mthfr in this early period of life developmental delay can be in all three forms of homocysteinuria hydrocephalus we see, can see that in MTHFR deficiency and uh, sometimes in cobalamin C, but not in, in classical homocysteinuria. Nystagmus is only uh, confined to uh, cobalamin C defect. If we look at late infancy and childhood, then we see that the stroke, stroke-like and arterial and venous occlusive disease can occur in all, in all conditions and all, all forms of homocysteinuria. And if you look at neurologic deterioration, that's mainly confined to the, to the remethylation defects, uh, to the cobalamin C and MTHFR. Spastic tetraparesis and also uh, peripheral neuropathy and cerebral ataxia, these neurologic conditions, we don't see them in this period of life in the, in the in the CVS deficiency, but we do see them in the remodulation defects. Lens dislocation is mainly related to classical homocysteinuria. We don't see that, there are a few cases reported, but it's very rare in the remodulation defects. Autistic features also in classical homocysteinuria, developmental delay, also all three conditions, also seizures, trichoreatric symptoms, and Again, this stagmus is only confined to the cobalamin C defect. Yeah. Then in uh, adolescence and in adulthood, we see uh, again the neurologic deterioration, acute, subacute, and chronic, is present in the cobalamin C and MTHFR, and also the combined degeneration of the spinal cord. But again, the, the vascular complications in the venous or in the arteriosis can be present in all three forms of homocysteinuria, mental retardation too, unexplained psychiatric symptoms in all three conditions and also seizures. Um, myoclonia only in remethylation effects and again in the stagmosine is generally only seen in the cobalamin C defect. Well, how do we do the the laboratory diagnosis of homocysteinuria. So if patients, if people, if patients have symptoms related to, to uh, homocysteinuria, so you want to, ex do want to explore if there is really a defect. So the, the, the starting point is of course to measure homocysteine. And it's important in this, in this that to know that homocysteine in plasma is mainly bound to albumin about 80 percent is bound to albumin then another 10-15 um, percent is bound to cysteine and to homocysteine itself then we get homocysteine it's a disulfide of homocysteine 
and only 1% of the total homocysteine is free homocysteine. So we want to have a good estimate of homocysteine, you have to measure the whole, the whole sum of all these compounds of homocysteine. And that's now generally very easy available in most clinical chemistry laboratories have an assay for homocysteine. So that is nowadays every doctor could, should have, should be able to have their homocysteine measured in a patient if they suspect, suspect uh, homocysteinuria, if they want to exclude homocysteinuria. The next step is to measure the other metabolites in the homocysteine uh, metabolism, cysteine, methionine, cysteine, and metabolic acid. Folate and B12 should be measured. And then one can measure enzyme activities in cells and do DNA diagnostics. But in general, the enzymes are in most cases not measured. Uh, it's made, most diagnoses are made on the metabolites and then uh, doctors go directly to the DNA uh, diagnostics. Treatment of homocysteinuria is an uh, interesting aspect of this metabolism that we can influence it in several ways. We can influence the, the metabolism and in, in this way of treat the metabolism. It's important to understand that uh, CBS, as I told you before, has vitamin B6 as cofactor, and this is also used as a treatment. Uh, also vitamin B12 we can provide, we can, um, vitamin B2 is not given in classical homocysteinuria, but in MTHFR deficiency it is. And also folate is also given. I'll go to that once again in several steps. At the first, if a patient uh, has, it has been diagnosed with classical homocysteinuria or CBS deficiency, the first step should be treatment of folate deficiency because most patients are folate deficiency, uh, are folate deficient at diagnosis. And that is again, can be explained by, by this slide because if CBS is, is uh, deficient, homocysteine accumulates and also methionine and acid and also methionine. And as it does, methionine inhibits MTHFR, and the metal tetrahydrofolate is not formed. And metal tetrahydrofolate is the circulating form of folate. So people who have CBS deficient are often at diagnosis deficient in folate. So that should be treated first before anything else will be done. Folate deficiency should be treated. And uh, sometimes from the same reason, Patients can also be deficient in vitamin B12. Okay. It's also interesting if one provides folate or metal tetrahydrofolate, that it's also a substrate. So it can push the reaction homocysteine back to methionine. And because we still think that homocysteine is the is the, the accumulation of homocysteine is the, the bad the bad guy in this uh, Yes, respect, and we want to have homocysteine as low as possible. It's good to have to lower homocysteine at the expense of higher methionine. So, use folate, and I think the folate, if possible, use folinic acid. I have a typo here, but uh, folinic acid is the, the form of folate I, I, I like to recommend to use. And vitamin B12 should be moni monitored. The next test is to test. Uh, to see if the patient is vitamin B6 responsive. And patients can be fully responsive, and that means that the homocysteine levels can be even close to normal. They can be partial responsive, and uh, also uh, can be non-responders. And this is because vitamin B6 is a cofactor of CBS, and if CBS is mutated, uh, vitamin B6 uh, can sort of uh, push the, the mutated CBS in a form which is more responsive. So it's a sort of uh, it, it, it influence the structure of the CBS protein in such a way that it becomes more active and homocysteine can be, can be converted and, and this way can be lowered. In, uh, worldwide, about 50% of the patients are B6 responsive. And this mainly depends on the on the mutation, which kind of mutation patients have. 
the, the third option, and it's particularly important in the non-responders, in the 5mb6 non-responders, and that is because it's protein restriction or methionine restriction. Methionine comes from the proteins. So if we have a low methionine in the diet, and it means that a methionine is a low protein diet with, uh, with supplementation of all the other amino acids and not methionine, the homocysteine level can be uh, very well decreased, but it's a very difficult diet. It's uh, very difficult for people, for patients to, to stay on the diet. And the fourth option we have is the use of beating. Uh, also in the introduction, I told that we in the liver and the kidney, we have the beating homocysteine metatransferase enzyme and beating can just be given in relatively high dose. And it pushes the reaction from homocysteine to methionine. Can even be so efficient that methionine levels become too high. And we don't want methionine to be higher than 800 or higher than 1000. A couple of years with Manuel Schiff from Paris, we, we made some uh, some suggestions how, how about the treatment. So if you have CBS deficiency, you have the low methionine diet, you have the B6 responsiveness. We we recommend in infants 50 250 to 250 milligrams per day, and in children and adults a higher dose up to 500 milligrams per day. The non-responders we still recommend to use some B6 because it's very difficult to say people is really totally non-responsive. There may be some effect still of the vitamin B6. So generally we recommend still to use some vitamin B6 in uh, even if patients are considered non-responsive. Then the folinic acid in the dose are one to five, one to five milligrams per day. Cobalamin, hydroxycobalamin can be given once a week. A milligram can be taken orally. There's no, no need to inject this. It can just be orally. It's more than it's good. It should not be injected. And betaine, high dose in children, 150 to 150 milligrams per kilogram per day. And in adults, 5 to 20 grams. You see, it's a very high dose, grams per day. And then uh, about uh, two times a day. Also, we give some suggestions about the treatment of the MTHFR and the uh, cobalamin C. Um, um, but we, uh, for today, I will not go into detail with that because they all these have very specific additional way how to treat this condition. For further reading, I also recommend to, to read our guidelines. We published uh, three years ago in the Journal of Inherited Metabolic Disease. <clears throat> There we also go through all the steps in treatment of uh, classical homocysteinuria. And does the treatment help? It's of course you can give treatment, but is it really of any use? Well, if you look at the homocysteine levels, you can see here, this is the isolus to 3 renin mutation. This is very well B6 responsive. You see that on vitamin B6, homocysteine drops dramatically. And the, if you use even other treatment, then they have very low homocysteine levels. Other mutations as the various responsive, but also in uh, by using all the treatment strategies, one can dramatically lower homocysteine. Is this of any any clinical uh, significance? Is of course a next important question. Well, therefore, I have first uh, go to one for one study. I have first I have to explain the relation between vascular disease and, uh, and, and uh, classical homocysteinuria. On the y-axis is depicted uh, the percentage of patients who had a thromboembolic event, and on the x-axis, the age of the patients. <clears throat> and you can see here that there are patients with classical, this is a study from Harvey Mudd, already published in 1985, and still a very good study if people want to uh, read more about classical homocysteinuria. This is an excellent study to uh, to read. But what we can see from the study that around the age of 25, about 50% of the patients have had a thromboembolic event, which is a very peculiar because normally people at young age have no uh, thromboembolic events. Sif and Yap 
um, did a study uh, already a couple of years ago, already 20 years ago, and she studied 158 patients from Sydney and Nijmegen, Dublin, Manchester, and London. And, um, and totally, he has had the, the years of treatment were almost 3,000 years of treatment by putting all these patients together. If we look at the study of Harvey Mudd, at this study, then we would expect to see 112 patients with a thromboembolic event. And these patients on treatment only 17 had a thromboembolic event. So you see about a tenfold reduction in incidence of thromboembolic events due to treatment. And you can also call it, call it a risk, risk ratio 0.09, and this is a confidence interval. This study clearly shows that the risk for the thromboembolic complications uh, is dramatically reduced by treatment. And all these clinical symptoms we see in classical homocystinuria, the, the risk of these complications can be reduced. So, of course, if the islands are removed, they will not come back again, they cannot treat it. But if people have minus five diopters and they take treatment, then you see that they don't, uh, that, the, uh, that, that the, the eyesight uh, stabilizes. Also, the skeletal abnormalities stabilizes, and mental retardation stabilizes, and also the vascular complications I showed in the previous slide can be prevented. So, treatment is not perfect, but it can uh, prevent, uh, the, can lower the, the risk of complications uh, clearly. Well, That's what I like to tell and like to look forward to see you in Brazil in the future. And uh, I enjoy uh, the Matata week. I hope to drink one soon again after the, after the COVID uh, crisis is uh, out of the world. And I send you the greetings from uh, Erasmus University Medical Center, which is depicted on this slide. It's uh, the biggest medical center in the, in the Netherlands. And this is the view from the building. This is the harbor in Rotterdam. Uh, I recommend if you have any time visit the Netherlands, also visit Rotterdam. It's a beautiful architecture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hank. I'm in time now. Okay. We have many, many questions and comments on the chat, but Simone, maybe you could start answering any, something? Podia começar perguntando, Simone? No. Would you like to start asking, Simone? Your mic is off, it's muted. Okay. So we start from the patient's ones, because I already know their questions. The ladies here, they are having their first period. So mothers are concerned about pregnancy in homocystinuria. They do not know about contraception, whether they are able to take them or not. I realize Mothers are really concerned about pregnancy because they are already dating, you know. Yes, the, um, there are very, uh, well, first of all, when women are considered to become pregnant, they should go to the doctor and have their homocysteine uh, checked and <coughs> sorry, have them optimize the treatment again. But um, the risk for the, for, the, for, the, for the fetus, for the offspring, for the baby, is not, uh, not, not uh, there are no uh, severe, uh, not, not, it's not described that it's bad for the, for, the, for the baby. But the mother itself, if the, um, the pregnancy can be an episode of a higher risk of thrombosis around delivery, and also the use of anticonce oral anticonceptive is also, um, and a higher risk for thrombosis. So people should really uh, take um, um, uh, probably uh, low-dose aspirin or low-dose heparin to uh, reduce the risk for thromboembolic complications. Is 
that answers the question? I think so. Alguma coisa mais, Simone, dessa parte de gestação? Yeah. Anything Why? else regarding pregnancy, Simone? Yeah, eu acho que sim, eu acho que deu para entender. I believe it answered your question. I will ask Hank to comment is that the main problem when a woman with classical homocystinuria is pregnant, do you think that the main problem is for the woman or for the fetus? Yeah, for what I mean, uh, they have a higher risk to have the baby with some abnormality? No, the, the risk for the baby is very small. And it's, uh, the risk is mainly the mother. Okay. Uh, there are no, I'm not aware of uh, babies who have uh, congenital abnormalities uh, or so uh, from mothers with homocystinuria. So the risk is mainly the mother itself and not so much, not, not uh, the baby. Dr. Ida, Dr. Ida, there's a mother here asking about how common is it for a patient having dystonia? Many questions regarding like the mutation, betaine, but we will start with like a more clinical question. Do you know if dystonia, dystonia is frequent in patients with classical homocystinuria? Movement abnormalities? No, no it's not that common. No. Okay. It can be secondary maybe, but not, uh, not, not the main symptom regarding the uh, b6 okay uh, because we have some patients uh, from the cblc group okay and one question from the cblc group is if uh, uh, those patients if they need to be on b6 therapy mm -hmm. that's a good question um, um, people do, uh, re in general, it is recommended to use some vitamin B6 to stimulate CBS to degrade homocysteine, but there are no studies uh, showing uh, it's beneficial. So it's, it's, it's a matter of discussion. If, if patients with uh, cobalamin C should take uh, ad additional uh, B6, but in general, we, at least I recommend to, to get use a low dose, even even lower than we published uh, a while ago. So maybe 10 or even 5, uh, maybe 25 milligrams per day. But if patients have to take a lot of treatment and any, any additional treatment is, of course, uh, cumbersome. It's uh, difficult to take all the treatment. So it, B6 is not really uh, very important in, in these cobalamin C defects. But okay. Uh, you know, the president of our Latin America Society on Embryos of Metabolism is attending your lecture, she attended, and she, uh, is, Aida, thanks very much for being with us. And she is asking if, uh, which is your opinion about the use of vitamin C in patients with classical homocystinuria who are not responsive to B6, like for protection of the vascular epithelium? Yes, it's, uh, there's no evidence. Dr. Ida, can you mention the name of the person? So. The person can ask the question on the mic. You just tell me the name and the person can ask themselves. Okay, so if you wanted to ask a question, um, you can ask in Portuguese. Remember that he does have translators, so you can ask the question in Portuguese if you like. Hank, can you comment about vitamin C? Yes, there is, there, there's no, no, no evidence. It's a, it's a beneficial effect. It, it, um, the atherosclerosis is not uh, is a process which is which we believe also radical play an important role, but we don't see really really clear atherosclerosis in in uh, classical homocystinuria. We see more 
thrombosis uh, kind of mechanisms. So in the artery and in the venous, we see more a clotting uh, problem. And in that, uh, that respect, it's not so uh, important to give uh, uh, radical scavengers like vitamin E and C and so on. So there's not much, I would not recommend to use high dose uh, vitamin C in the uh, classical homocysteinuria. Simone, tu quer fazer um mix comigo? Daí tu pergunta, então. Simone, would you like to ask a question? Dr. Ida, please ask him when the patient go to the vitamin B C examination. How long do you think the patient has to be on pyridoxine before starting the diet? Yes. The responsiveness of B6. One question is uh, how much time we have to wait to see uh, if the patient is responsive or not. The mm -hmm. second question is if it's possible that at the beginning a patient is responsive, but uh, with the time he becomes non-responsive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the first uh, question is if, pa if people, if patients are picked up via uh, via uh, uh, selective screening, that means via when they have complications and go to a doctor, and then at, at, at the, after a period is found out that they have classic homocysteinuria, they should take high dose vitamin B6, as we have recommended, and take it for about four to six weeks before we can estimate before they take a new uh, plasma samples to measure homocysteine. So it should be about a month on B6 treatment to, to have a good evaluation. But this is by systematic screening. If you have newborn screening, it's a different story because newborn screening is not happening in many countries. And also I don't think in Latin America, there is a newborn screening on home class homocysteinuria, is it? Mm, no. Uh, um Maybe uh, now, uh, Simone, maybe you could... Uh, uh, Simone, tu podia abrir o microfone da Aida, da professora Aida. Simone, maybe you could open Professor Aida microphone so she comment. Então? If they use the tandem, the neonatal screening by tandem, so the methionine is captured. Okay. Yeah. So uh, they consider to use uh, methionine as a biomarker for classical homocysteinuria in Brazil, or they will set it up, they will, they start already? What, Hank? I didn't understand. It, uh, is, uh, do you in Brazil screen for classical homocysteinuria by methionine? Uh, we do not screen in the public system. But mm. the private system, when they use the tandem machine, they measure the, they see the methionine, methionine. So. No, well, it's important because if you use methionine as a biomarker in numerous Thine. treatment, you only find the six non-responsive patients. So in, in, uh, in Ireland and in England, they do also newborn screening. Then they do a very, still a very small test. They give the baby, uh, uh, B6 for a couple of weeks and then they measure homocysteine again. But they are generally non responsive. So if you find patients by methionine in numerous screening, they are well being um, not B6 responsive. Uh, and the second question oh, if uh, we have a patient who is responsive at the beginning, if with the time he can become non responsive. Yeah, you see sometimes, you see in patients that in the years they, they become a little bit less responsive, particularly by young children. Young, you see sometimes they are very responsive and uh, still taking the same dose of B60, uh, homocysteine goes up. I, I've, I've no good explanation for that. Um, it does happen, I know, but uh, I, don't, I do not understand why. So it can be... But, but pe if people are really B6 responsive, they will stay B6 responsive, but response can be less. Okay. Uh, regarding the non-responsive patients, uh, people are asking 
uh, which is your experience with the use of betaine for the treatment of this patient, and which would be the highest dosage of betaine that we can use for treatment? Yeah, this was in this slide. You can go back. It's in this, oh, yeah. You can see that depends on the, just the beating dose is given here. You see for children, 150 to 250 milligrams per kilogram per day, two times a day, and adults, five to 20 grams, max 20 grams, two, two times a day. So that's about the dose for, for beating. And the, the, was, the other question was about. Uh, if betaine is a good or like a bad drug for the treatment of non-responsive patients, what do you think? Yeah, it's we, useful and things like mm, that. I, I, I would recommend to, if people are not P6 responsive, to of course do the folate and B12, but try to, to get a, a methionine restricted diet as much as possible. It's a very difficult diet, and I think particularly in adolescence and adulthood, it's, uh, uh, patients will not take it anymore. Um, but still, patients can still be uh, low in protein intake if possible. So I would say, first say try to, to get as low as possible in the proteins, which that will still affect your homocysteine level. And then in the second step is to use um, betaine. So betaine is not a first line treatment. The first line treatment is, should be low methionine, low protein. And then the second step, use betaine. Dr. Aida? Oi. A mãe ali está perguntando aqui. There's a mother asking for how long do they test a newborn regarding B6? responsiveness test, okay? You told in your presentation that uh, uh, classical homocystinuria patients who are picked up by neonatal screening, probably they have the non-responsive form. Do you agree? Yes. This is, yeah, this is what we expect. So if uh, we uh, have a newborn uh, with the diagnosis of classical homocystinuria, for how much time we should test this newborn for responsiveness? If the baby is not, if the baby is picked up by newborn screening, yeah, only two weeks. Only two weeks. Okay. A short, a short period, because uh, still you want to see if there's any response, uh, if there is any response after two weeks. But uh, I, I am aware of newborn screening, and I. Only one patient of the many patients I heard about, only one was partially responsive. And generally, patients who are responsive to B6 have normal methionine at birth. So you okay. cannot find them by methionine. And okay. uh, only the non-responsive ones have a high methionine after birth. Okay. Uh, we have many, uh, many questions uh, regarding classical hem homocysteinuria, but I will change to the CBLC group, okay? They have uh, two questions. The first question is about folinic acid. If uh, you are aware of the difference between the use of folinic acid or uh, calcium folinate, okay? And uh, Okay, this first question, I do the second later. Yeah, if, if you, you can, folic acid can be bought in a pharmacy, it's very cheap, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a not a natural form of folate. So folic acid is the, it's a, it needs to be reduced before it is active. And the folic acid is resembling the natural forms of folate. So it is inhibiting uh, folate metabolism. So I really recommend, particularly in the remethylation defect, like the cobalamin Cs, where they use a higher dose of, uh, of folate, they should, uh, I recommend fol folinic acid, because that's uh, uh, 
a form of, for used folate who is immediately available and um, that is probably better than, uh, than, for, than, than, than the synthetic form folic acid. Thank you. The second question is about B12, okay? The plasmatic levels of B12 in CBLC patients, because as they receive uh, B12, sometimes like uh, even every other day, uh, they usually have high levels of B12 in plasma. And uh, they, uh, they are asking if, uh, uh, what would be the like, uh, best level if they can trust in the levels as a biomarker of the treatment? No, it's no, there's, no, there's no need to measure B12 on, on treatment. In the cobalamin C patients, they should take uh, a very high, the highest dose of hydroxycobalamin uh, orally and uh, intramuscular. And uh, the measurement of B12 has no use. It's a B12 will be sky high in, in, in plasma, in blood, but that's, uh, it doesn't matter if it's 20,000 or 40,000 or 10,000. It has no, not, not, not much meaning. It is not used to monitor treatment. Okay, there is one question regarding the betaine uh, treatment. Uh, uh, what would be like the problem if the patient uses like a high dosage of betaine? I mean, what's the adverse event of betaine? What we should take care of? Yeah, the betaine does not, not much adverse events, in particularly not in remethylation defects. There is some uh, doubt uh, that the combination in classical homocystinuria, if they take very high dose, I mean, taking a higher dose than we recommend is of no use. It only costs money. And that is not more effective. Uh, this, the dose we recommend, and also the, the, the company recommend, is uh, it, it doesn't help if to give any higher. And uh, there is some in, in classical homocysteineuria where methionine goes high. The combination of high beating and high methionine may be uh, bad for the, for the patient. So don't take higher beating than recommended. Okay. Uh, now, regarding the genotype-phenotype association, uh, that mutation, I, I278T, okay? If uh, the patient is, uh, has one allele with this mutation and the second allele is like a very severe allele with a nonsense mutation, uh, what do you expect that the patient is responsive or non-responsive? It cannot be completely predicted. The genotype gives an indication, and many patients who have uh, the, the really good B6 responsive mutation in combination with another mutation are to some extent B6 responsive. But there are, are people who have such a combination who are not B6 responsive at all. So in this way, to understand this is that because the active CBS is a complex of four to eight uh, CBS proteins and how did that cluster together and some mutations have so much effect on this clustering bad effect on this clustering that there is no uh, room for B6 uh, responsiveness uh, so it can, not, it can to a certain extent one can expect one can but it's not uh, not always the case no unfortunately Simone, mais alguma coisa? Simone? Hmm. Anything else, Simone? Tá com o fone desligado. Your mic is off, Simone. Não, ninguém, nenhuma mãe mais me fez pergunta aqui. No, no further question here. Those were the questions that we received so far. Ok. Hank, Hank, we think we asked uh, all the questions that uh, we had in the chat. So I would like to know if you have something else to tell us. We really appreciate it. 
uh, the chat is in Portuguese, but after I can show you, people, they like, appreciated very much the, the lecture, okay? Uh, so, thank you very much. It's my great, uh, really great pleasure to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to lecture, and next time I hope to be able to come to Brazil and to, to see, to look people in the eyes and to talk face to face. Because it's more easy than uh, in the, this system. But this is the second best option, I would say. And uh, I'm okay. really, uh, really happy. I'm very pleased to do so. Okay. Simone, to can you Simone, would you like to wrap up with a few words? Dr. Hank, Dr. Hank, you are always welcome here in Brazil. We always have something to learn from you. Every time you want to be here, we'll be there in the audience listening to your talk. Two years time, one or two years time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Ele disse, Simone, que tem que agora esperar um ou dois anos por causa da pandemia. Simone, he just censored um, that he has to wait about one or two years. Uh, Hope it was, goes really quick. Mm, yeah. So maybe you can wrap up, Simone. We'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank the interpreters. Everything worked fine. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Hank because he's always here available to help us. And as a mother, I'd like to let everyone know that we have a really difficult treatment, but a treatment that is possible. I see that lots of people have a hard time following the treatment, but this treatment is possible to be done. Nowadays, my son is so doing so well that we have to increase his numbers because he has got everything under control. But it's a 24-7 work. Unfortunately, when we have a late diagnosis, it's a little bit difficult. But hopefully, we are going to have an early diagnosis soon here in Brazil so that patients can be treated from birth. At the moment, we only have one small daughter of almost one year who had been already diagnosed, and she's going to be our, our reference. She's one of the first ones that I, I met that had an early diagnosis. Lots of others just had diagnosis after a few years, but we are struggling to improve this here in the country. We have already being able to incorporate the formula to be freely distributed by the country. Uh, we still do not have the appropriate food yet, and we still need the early diagnosis for HCU, but hopefully we are going to have that soon. Because we want our patients to have a better prognosis. Well, if I could, I would bring everyone to my house and I would let them know and show them that following the treatment it's, it's possible. I prefer, you know, struggling with a difficult treatment rather than having issues in the future for us and for our children. I'd like to thank Dr. Ida for all her help, and I have no words to thank the interpreters. Thank you so much for your help. So if you wanted to say anything, Ida, I just said my final words. I wrote here in the chat, and I'd like to thank everyone's attendance here. I was checking the numbers of participants and we reached almost 90, 90 listeners. And that was incredible. Simone, congratulations. 
thank you for organizing all of this. If it weren't because of you, we wouldn't be here. Just to say that things only happen when we become activists. So congratulations, everyone. Congratulations, all family members taking part in this meeting. Just one question that a mother just sent to me. I know the answer, but she's asking here about the formula. Does that reduce the complication risks? Can you please check if my answer is correct? Well, formulas are only given to people who are, do not respond to P6 and who have a, hypo, a low protein intake. But if they do not follow the diet and do not take it properly, the risks are going to be almost the same. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so thank you. Would you like to say oh. final words? About the treatment? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, uh, all treatments, uh, the treatment helps. And uh, it can be better, it can be worse, but any treatment helps, even, uh, yeah. I, I, as I said, I, I, people on our patients are not B6 responsive. They should uh, do their best on the diet, and it's very difficult, I know. But if they uh, take the betaine and take the folate, and uh, if they stay low in protein, they have still uh, uh, the treatment still has a very good uh, effect on the outcome. Uh, still, the risk for com complications are there, but uh, the, the risk is much lower than untreated. Okay. Então, tchau para todo mundo, né? Thanks, Hank. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Hank. Bye. Bye, tchau, tchau obrigada. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Tchau. Pode desligar, Mickey.